The modern experiment, it seems, has proven Aristotle was onto something. Sadly, the modern experiment has also given us a new way to die. Kotakushi. Hello, and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? That's this podcast aimed at folks like, hopefully you, right, who want to hear something that helps them make sense of this dislocation, this deep sense of dislocation that's hitting us from every angle. On this pod, we talk about heavy things lightly. We'll use theology and history and philosophy and years of deeply immersive experiences in foreign cultures to figure out how did we get here. Our pod goes beyond rhetorical rabbits, the quickly reproduced media memes meant to entertain us and make big money for big media, and we'll go past the rabbits and take a look at new world phenomena from an old world perspective. Join me, John Hears, our team of First Things Foundation field workers, as we wonder aloud, why are we talking about rabbits again? This is episode 19. This is Masks, Aristotle, and the Idiot. So, I've been traveling a lot lately. I just got back from visiting our impresarios up in Appalachia. A week before that, I was in Sierra Leone. I'll go to Guatemala in November, all a part of our work. Check us out at www.firstthings.org. Traveling now is possible, but you got to take precautions. One precaution is the mask. I've been wearing a lot of masks lately. Really, all the time, not just lately. Everywhere I go. It's interesting. Wearing a mask while not being part of some druid candy event called Halloween is metaphysically challenging. Wearing a mask makes people feel. It makes people aware of themselves. Have you noticed that? Today I'm going to share what this travel to the old world has taught me about the new world and the mask. So, masks and the new world from an old world perspective. One thing that strikes Westerners about old world norms, and remember on this podcast, the old world is what's happened to people Uh, not what happened to them, but what people were like perhaps before the Enlightenment, both in European culture before that time and all around the world, even up till today in places like Sierra Leone, where I just got back from. It's a way of seeing the world. Well, one thing that strikes Westerners about old world norms, and I see this for sure in West Africa, is the utter lack of privacy. People come and go, unannounced, in and out of your personal space. In the village, a door is no more than a sheet hanging over a doorless doorway. Clapping substitutes for a doorbell, and bam, people are in your hut. In fact, neighbors will send their children to sit with you if you choose to stay alone in your hut or in your home. They don't like that. They think that you're sad. For a red-blooded New World wasp, it's all very rude. People are up in your grill. And to tell the truth, it's also tiring. Like it works on you. It wears you down. It's one of the most difficult parts about deep immersion in really, really old world settings. But for old worlders, being alone is something like being ill. That's why they don't want you to be alone in this traditional societies like West Africa or parts of Southeast Asia or really a lot of places. And guess what? A very ancient guy, but in many ways a very new worldy prophet, a guy named Aristotle, well, he agrees with this aspect of the old world. The part about being alone makes you sick. He agrees that there's great danger in imagining oneself as autonomous. In The Politics, one of his books, one of his 
narratives on how to live. He makes it clear that those who live outside of community, those who imagine they are their own, the folks who think of themselves as autonomous, yeah, they're not really thinking at all. They are idiots, literally. Aristotle pointedly uses, as a pejorative, the Greek word idios, or self, to describe people who fail to contribute and participate within the community. In short, for Aristotle, one who thinks himself or herself autonomous and not beholden to others, for Aristotle, that type of person is literally an idiot. But I'm afraid it's a lot worse than that. In a most disturbing article in Slate magazine, Matthew Bremer writes about Kodokushi. You can check it out in our pod notes. Kodokushi is a modern Japanese phenomenon from right now it's happening in Japan that loosely means death by loneliness. In Japan today, many people are dying lonely deaths in their apartments away from the community away from everything. Most deaths by loneliness, Kodokushi, go unnoticed for days, sometimes months. Human beings decomposing alone in boxy apartments, unknown to their neighbors, unknown to society. Some estimate that as many as 30,000 people a year die alone and deteriorate alone and are swept up by a cleaning agency. Often the causes of death elude corners. Most cases of Kodokushi are men, almost 90%. They're newly retired often, living alone and in their 60s. But there are many cases of Kodokushi that are far younger. Two sisters, both in their 30s, recently died lonely and apart, but both in Tokyo. It took weeks before they were noticed as missing. What's going on? Many in Japan attribute Kodokushi to a change in lifestyle that began after World War II. Of course, Japan lost that war, and in the years that immediately followed, Japanese culture began to shift away from the feudal and communitarian values of old Japan and toward a more modern economic and cultural milieu. Right? That new Japan after, really, after 1945, that new Japan that developed, well, it mirrored the new world, the new world that aligned with the values in places like the United States and Europe, and the new world that had defeated the emperor of Japan and his very feudal understanding of the world. In the 1950s and 60s, so, Japan's nation builders put aside a nationalistic military past, their feudal past, for a modern economic future. They kind of had to, right? They weren't, in terms of the occupation of, of of the allied forces, but also because they had to play the game that was the modern world, the new world. Right, under threat. And they should have been under threat. I mean, they lost the war that, in which they were the aggressors. My point, though, is that there was a shift, a very powerful and a quickly moving shift. Right, It was a rapidly changing society in the 1950s, and this shift demanded concentrated labor. In an article in the New York Times, author Noromutsi Onishi, well, he reflects on on this shift. In the 1960s, the Japanese government, Onishi says, built huge housing developments outside of Tokyo and other cities, each holding thousands of young salarymen, men entrusted with rebuilding Japan's post-war economy. The complexes, giant, massive, sprawling collections of buildings, they called dianchi. Well, these dianchi they introduced Japan to a Western structure of life centered on the nuclear family. The nuclear family here being mother, father, children. 
Well, that Western structure moved into Japan after the war, and everything was built around the idea of the nuclear family because the nuclear family is what was known as the positive development post-Enlightenment. This development in Japan, it broke the traditional generational family living arrangements, the multi-generational homes that had been built. Onichi goes on to say that that change in Japan mirrored the change in Europe after the Enlightenment, 200 years before. So, this also happened in the United States in the 1950s. Exactly this, the building of projects, led to something we now call the projects. If you've ever been to New York City, you see these massive housing developments And they were built for workers who would then come and work, right, on the East River in large factories. And those factories, right, would be fed by this concentrated labor who lived in the projects. Often black folks, but not always, by any means. Well, these projects, as we know, have now turned into pretty, why shall we say, rough places, impoverished places. Well, in Japan, they're turning into old folks' homes, but old folks by the thousands who are alone. So the key to understanding this shift, right, are in the words multi-generational homes. In the old world, including feudal Japan, including in West Africa and Mali, you can see it in East Africa and Ethiopia, you can see it in the Georgian Republic, you can see it. You see it in all of the old world. Families did not live and do not live in what we call nuclear families. For most of the old world, living arrangements are in extended families, usually three generations tied together on one plot or in two or three small homes connected together. Three generations sharing rooms and smells and time together. Multi-generational living arrangements versus nuclear family living arrangements. So this wasn't just Japan that was shifting after the war. Check out what the filmmaker Barry Levinson says about his 1990 film Avalon, which is a really good movie. You should check it out. Right? It's a movie about Baltimore it was set in the 1960s and 70s. Levinson's trying to say something about the nature of community. He's quoted in an article written by David Brooks, he's quoted as saying, quote, this is Levinson, the movie maker, quote, in my childhood, you'd gather around the grandparents and they would tell the family stories. Now individuals, he says, sit around the television, quote, watching other families and their stories, unquote. So the main theme of Avalon, Levinson saying in this article with David Brooks, and you can check out the pod notes for the article. The main theme in the movie is the decentralization of the family. And for Levinson, this has continued even further. And he says, quote, once families at least gathered around the television. Now each person has their own screen, unquote. And really, this is the story of the new world in many ways. It's a story of fragmentation or individuality or freedom. It depends on your angle, right? Fragmentation is one way to understand it. And in Japan, it's what death looks like when the individual is no longer of any use. You see, people have to be hired to bury your remains because no one is there to do it for you. Not your family. Brooks, the New York Times editorialist, he ends his article by saying this, quote, If you want to summarize the changes in family structure over the past century, the truest thing to say is this, we've made life freer for individuals and more unstable for families. We've made life better for adults, but worse for children and their grandparents. The modern experiment, it seems, has proven Aristotle was onto something. Sadly, the modern experiment has also given us a new way to die. 
Kotakushi. Community, it seems, and this is what I'm taking away from my trips, and I want to get back in the mask in a second, but community, it seems, is more than just something in which we live. It seems community is that thing from which we actually derive life, right? Think of the Christian God, the Trinity, three in one, in relationship. Relationships are iconic in the sense they're like medicine, not really optional. Relationships are something you choose. Relationships are life in some ways. And in creating them, we create life. Where we lack them, uh, it's possible we create, well, nothing. This is true in schools, in business, and in the business of charity. No one has ever built anything by themselves. That's actually fact. C.S. Lewis famously intones, I think it's at the end of mere Christianity, or it could be, but it's famous, this quote, you can look it up. The only thing an individual can do on his own, utterly, is go to hell. And that brings me to this thing I started with, the masks. Look, I don't know if masks really, 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 really help us fight this virus. I'm sure they make a difference. But a mask? A mask? Yeah, maybe more than any other symbol known to human beings has represented division. It's the single most profound symbol, if you're asking me. I just bought some when I was in Sierra Leone. I just gave one to my daughter, actually. But everybody knows what a mask is. It's a, it's a profound symbol of human separation. It hides the window of the soul from the windows of other souls. It obscures. It makes the language of expression a smile or a frown, right? It makes it opaque. It makes that language impossible to enter. It separates us. And if Aristotle is right, well, we can't be separate for too long or we die. Like literally, the old world is shouting up to us from behind. It's shouting up to the new world. It's warning us of something very important, I think. It's warning us that health begins with communion. I hope somehow we can all hear this old world message it seems important. And it's not to say that you shouldn't wear a mask. That's not even close to what I'm trying to say. But the new world and the old world here are a little out of sync. There's a sense in the new world that to protect yourself and in turn to protect others is itself a form of health. Despite the spiritual danger the spiritual danger that actually could lead to death. But of course, there's all kinds of death. And I don't think anybody, or there aren't many who would argue that there is a type of spiritual death, a type of artistic death that can take place in the soul of people who are separated. So you got to get separated a little bit, I guess. I wore a mask, I had to travel, I had to wear a mask. But man... I don't know if that's an answer to the question of COVID. I know in the old world, it's not an answer. Well, temporarily, perhaps. Shani Skaki Marjos, that means to you the victory. It's often said at the KB table in the Georgian Republic. That's our pod for today. Thanks for coming along. Listen carefully, because coming up, we've got some really cool both friends and folks you'll know kind of some popular interesting characters who would call themselves very new world and very proud of it we've got them scheduled up in the coming weeks i can't wait to share and have those good conversations watar why are we talking about rabbits watar is produced by andrew schwartz and daniel paternos and our pod is brought to you by the creators of first things that's a nonprofit. That's our nonprofit that lives and works in some of the world's most impoverished places. We immerse there in order to create momentum for local change makers. Those are folks we call impresarios. 
impresarios, like those who produce art. We get behind those impresarios and we fight and we push for their vision of a better life. Share Water with friends. Hit us up with solid reviews on iTunes and everywhere you get your podcast. Your love for us allows us to love and serve others. Nakfam dis, that's goodbye in Georgian. Hasta luego, that's Spanish. Cambufo, that's Bambara. And au revoir, that's French. Peace out. See you next week on Water. <laughs> <laughs>